today I want to get to um, give some kind of a more sketch, less complete, more than a sketch, less than a complete proof of the L2 extension theorem. Sometimes it's called the Osawa Takegoshi. Um, so, th I guess uh, it's more general than the original theorem they had, but less general than it could be. But this will be, you actually can't prove the full L2 extension theorem with this technique that I'm, or at least I don't know how to prove it with this technique. Uh, but I'll give you uh, some case which is maybe the easiest to explain. So, we, we have... Uh, a Stein Kaler manifold. And then we have um, a holomorphic function that's bounded, so it maps into the unit disk. Holomorphic. And then I'm going to let Z be just the set of all zeros of this T. And I want to assume that it's smooth in some strong sense. So, so dt restricted to z is never zero. Okay. Um, and then aside from this, we have a holomorphic line bundle. And then we have a metric, uh, Hermitian metric e to the minus phi with the familiar condition, dv bar phi plus the Ricci curvature of omega is non-negative. Then the conclusion is that um, for all holomorphic sections uh, of this line bundle L over z, uh, such that the integral of f squared e to the minus p, e, uh, say e a of omega, finite. Uh, oh, I need a little bit more than this. <clears throat> there exists a holomorphic section over x such that uh, it interpolates this initial data on z, and then it has a bound on its L2 norm and the I guess there's some constant here which I'm going to write down in a second And traditionally, uh, the, the important part of this theorem was that the constant was universal. So it just sort of only depends on the universe. <laughs> so it doesn't depend on anything else. But uh, what the Sharpe constant uh, is was not known until f relatively recently. Anyway, with this, these kinds of normalizations, the Sharpe constant is pi. And that's going to be important in uh, the last lecture. Uh, okay, so the universality of this of this thing really allows you to do a lot of great things, like um, study sort of line bundles with with very asymptotically in some sense. So a very very large curvature. You can you can take twists of them. Um, and you still always have this universal thing. So, yeah? Uh, for compact Kähler, if you have a smooth, if you have a smooth, uh, well, okay. The answer is yes, but it isn't pi. So, 
um, it depends a little bit. See, the prob the, what's maybe hidden here a little bit is that this submanifold uh, is cut out by a bounded holomorphic function, which of course you can't do on any compact manifold. But even if you're given any hypersurface in a Stein manifold in principle, in general, you cannot find a holomorphic function that cuts it out. You'll need... Right. And then the curvature of the line bundle of which of the, that that is a section of will enter into this. Well, it will depend on um, more than that. So it will depend on what kind of metrics you can put on that. And it's not completely clear in general. So you have to be given all that data. Otherwise, but then once you know that, uh, you can write down the sharp constant. Um, yeah. It hasn't actually been done in all cases. Only in a case where you can find a metric of non-negative curvature for this funny line bundle. Okay. Sure. Many there might be no Correct. So this theorem wouldn't apply there, but there is an analogous theorem. So the, the analogous theorem is that you, you have, uh, okay, so I'll just do it quickly because I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. No, no, it's fine. So you have some z inside x, and then you take the line bundle associated to z. Um, and then, of course, there's also a section t of this line bundle that exactly cuts out this z and generates the ideal blah, blah, blah. Um, but what you need, and this is what I was telling Tomas, was you need this extra metric for this line bundle. And the curvature of this metric matters for this condition. So then the condition becomes something like d d bar phi plus the Ricci of omega has to be greater than or equal to d d bar lambda and also greater than or equal to 1 plus delta d d bar lambda for some positive number delta. So for example, if you have non-negative thing, then you can forget about this condition. It's just this one. But in general, we don't know. The other thing is that this metric has to restrict to z as something uh, reasonable. OK, and then, and then the L2 norm will change a little bit in the denominator. You have to make sense of it. Uh, <clears throat> This will be the denominator instead. And then if this thing is positive, then the constant is, uh, I think it's uh, 1 over delta plus 1 times pi. So if you really can find a flat thing, you can let this delta go to infinity, you'll recover the pi case. In that case. But anyway, that's what happens in the more general one. Okay, um, so, well, I made this claim that this is a sharp constant, so you at least have to see that it's true in one case, but it's, it's easy to see if you take x to be the disk, omega to be the Euclidean metric, um, and phi to be zero, so your line bundle is trivial, and then take t, of z just equal to z, so that your capital Z is just the origin. So you're trying to extend something from the origin to the disk with a given value there, and the claim is that the constant will give you this. If you have a constant at the, di at the center, you just take that constant to be the function, and that extension will satisfy the sharp estimate. So, <clears throat> and somehow, this looks like maybe a silly example, but it's the example we're going to try to reduce to. So what we're going to try to do is actually shrink x onto z in some nice way so that the weight essentially becomes a constant. And then the, the thing you're trying to extend is already extended because you have some kind of infinitesimal neighborhood. And so it's going to satisfy the sharp estimate. And then what we want to prove is that as you grow this domain along this deformation, the constant only gets better. So that's the strategy.
That's a kind of model case. Okay, so now let's uh, <clears throat> let's start into the proof. So first we have to do uh, a little bit of reduction in order to apply the technique that we're going to do. One of the reductions we're going to use is, that, is to shrink uh, x to some relatively compact pseudo-convex uh, subdomain, which I'll keep calling x. Um, and then, and therefore, the, the section that we started with is actually going to be defined on some neighborhood of this domain. So uh, we can, in other words, we're going to assume that F is defined up to the boundary, uh, as is all the data, as are omega e to the minus phi t. I think that's all the data. Um, so how do you reduce to this case? Well, the claim is that once you know how to do this on some relatively compact subset, shrinking the z into its intersection with this compact subset, it's only going to be a smaller norm than this one. So this will be an up, a universal upper bound. And then you just use some weak star compactness to, to pass to the limit. So it's just basic real analysis to make this reduction. So that's what we're going to assume from now, from now on. Um, and then uh, the next step, so this is, this is the reduction. The next step is that, so the, the claim, which I'm not going to prove, is that there exists some uh, capital F, maybe capital F, uh, let's call it capital F tilde, holomorphic section on the closure of X such that the restriction of F tilde to Z is this little f. So, oh, and um, another reduction that we need to... We need this, we need to also assume that this singular Hermitian metric is also smooth. And that, that was the, the spiel that I gave last at the end of last lecture about how on Stein manifolds you can always smooth the sections and still keep their curvature non-negative. In this case, this Ricci twisted curvature non-negative. Um, okay, so how do you how do you do something like this? Well, this is this is really not part of the yoga I'm espousing here. This is more standard thing. If you have this submanifold Z, well, you can sort of make local extensions um, of F here, and then <clears throat> doesn't, you can take some other extension in, in the re or some other any function in the rest, and then you try to patch them together. And then it's, it's really a problem about some sheaf cohomology. And if you use this Dolbo isomorphism thing, then uh, you, it's just about solving the D-bar equation. Hormander theorem will show you on Stein manifolds there are no obstructions. If it's a if it's a domain in 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 CN, for example, then you can really just because this thing is extending past the boundary, you can really just uh, extend constant. I mean, you choose some holomorphic transverse section, which you can do on Stein manifolds, and then you are right, in CN, I guess. Um, and then you're just going to extend holomorphically uh, to, to some neighborhood, extend F constant, then you cut it off, and then you have to somehow use the D-bar equation to, to correct this smooth extension to a holomorphic one. There's a little bit involved. You have to, you have to insert some singularity here, because when you, get the, when you solve the D-bar theorem, you get some solution, but you don't know if it's the original thing you want. You want whatever you add to this to correct it to vanish on the initial data set. And so you need to introduce some singularity. 
And this is where you lose the estimate. So if you introduce some singularity, it'll be something like the metric 1 over t squared. Anything that's L2 with respect to this metric will have to vanish along the zero set of t. And then, but, <clears throat> um, well, it's not, it's not global in this, uh, in general. Um, I mean, in this case, I suppose it is. Anyway, um, you're going to lose some curvature when you introduce this singularity. But because you're on a Stein manifold, remember yesterday I said that the trivial bundle has a metric of positive curvature. And you can twist it. It's still a trivial bundle. So you can get back as much curvature as you want. And then so it's another way of saying the, the vanishing theorem, uh, I guess, more directly. So OK, so this you can do. but And so if you do it on a slightly larger domain than the x you're interested in, then its restriction to this subdomain that we've, re we've reduced to is automatically L2 because everything is smooth. So it means that, so this guy, this f tilde, is automatically in L2 of x e to the minus v v omega. So you've got some extension, and therefore there is some constant uh, so that that extension is less than or equal to this number. Uh, but the, this, this point, the constant depends on the data t too much, and you can't take limits or anything like that. So you need to make a much better uh, L2 extension than this one, because you don't know much about this one. So the thing to do is to take, so let f be the extension of minimal L2 norm. Uh, and all right, so the whole, the, whole, the whole rest of the talk is about trying to get estimates for the extension of minimal norm. So now we need to estimate this extension. OK. All right, so in order to estimate it, I need a, man a manageable expression for it. So I'm going to um, formulate this, the, the norm in some dual way. So. Okay, I'm going to introduce some notation. So let's let A for analytic be the, the set of all holomorphic sections <coughs> with a finite L2 norm. X bar means the closure of X, sorry. Yeah, so up to the boundary. That's what makes it L2. Otherwise, it could be blowing up. Um, so let me define this L2 ideal of Z. Call it I phi of Z. is going to be the set of all G in uh, this A of phi such that <coughs> the restriction of G to z is identically 0. And so the annihilator of this guy <coughs> that's just going to be the set of all bounded linear functionals on this A um, <coughs> which kill anything in this ideal. zero for all G in this I. Uh, 
And so then, this is some trivial linear algebra proposition. Um, so for all f holomorphic on z, say, smooth up to the boundary. So maybe, maybe just write it like this, up to, so up to the boundary so that we have some, extent, some L2 extension to begin with. Um, <clears throat> the minimal extension F0 of F <clears throat> satisfies that its squared L2 norm is equal to the supremum of C F squared over norm C squared star for all C in this annihilator. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm already assuming, after this reduction, that I'm working in a domain inside a Stein manifold where z sticks out like this. And then I'm saying, suppose I take a holomorphic section which is defined on some, on this piece, say, which is therefore is L2. As I've argued, there's some L2 extension. Right? And now um, I want to I want to write down its norm for you by some dual formulation. And I'm claiming that this is the formulation. So if you, you just take any extension, so for any f, which is well, in A2, A of phi, such that f restricted to z is little f. Is it OK? Did I, you, I didn't let you finish your question, but did I answer it? No, I think so. This domain and the Stein manifold, the submanifold Z is this restriction to this. Yeah, yeah. So um, convex, yeah. it's nice. Sure, yeah. I mean, or it could stick out a little. It doesn't. Okay, so, right. I mean, if you think about this, it doesn't matter what extension you put in here. If you have another extension, then the difference uh, must vanish on z, and it's going to be killed by this expression. So you expect this somehow only to, to depend on little f, and then it's not hard to confirm that it is the norm of the minimal extension. Okay. So essentially what you want to do is try to estimate this quantity. But the trouble is that um, these annihilators, they're not so manageable directly. I mean, how, how do you estimate something like this? Well, you'd like to try to estimate, estimate by some duality. And you could, in principle, do that with a Reese representation theorem. But the trouble is here, you're in the annihilator, not in the whole space. So you have to be a little careful. But it's not difficult what to do. You, you, um, you choose a good, dense subspace. So, so for example, well, um, if I take, uh, say, H, which is, uh, let me write it like this. So this is just going to mean sections of L that are smooth with compact support in Z. So and this time it's sort of slightly relevant. I mean, when I mean compact support in Z, I mean it's the support is a compact subset of this subdomain X. So it doesn't go up to the boundary. And then... For each one of these guys, you can define this C sub H, which takes, say, some F in here to the integral over Z of F H bar uh, e to the minus phi dA over dt squared omega. So these guys 
um, they generate a dense subspace of all the uh, elements in the annihilator. And to check that, you just have to check that if all these guys kill uh, some f, then f actually must vanish on z. Then, then from uh, Han Banak or something, you you see that it's a dense subspace. Right? But if if these are just these little bumps along z, and so if this is zero for all all little bumps along z, then this f must vanish on z. So. So th this collection of all such, well, I should say, the collection of all such things is dense. So therefore, in order to compute this L2 norm, we can just uh, in fact, we have to uh, estimate this just for the C sub H. The have to is not the important part. The fact that we can is the important part. OK, so well, let's take a look at, so therefore, enough to estimate so you have your fixed guy. And then you're going to look at CH star in, in this annihilator. Yeah. Right? Because the, this norm is, is the soup over these. And if you have a dense subset, you just have to estimate these guys. OK, so let's, let's take a look at the numerator of this expression. So let me write L2z for the Hilbert space, which is L2 on the space z with the weight e to the minus phi over dt squared omega. So just the L2 norm that I've been using all along. But now I'm not asking for holomorphic sections, just L2. <clears throat> and then in here, we'll have a subspace, which I'll call E, because I'm running out of letters. This is just uh, this L2 intersect with holomorphic sections. So those are kind of the ones I'm interested in. And that, this is very similar to the story we told when we talked about the Bergman kernel. This is a closed subspace by this Bergman's inequality again. And so you have, again, an orthogonal projection to E. So this bounded projection, which is it also called Bergman kernel. I think maybe there's one person here that actually met Bergman. Did you, did you no. meet him? Nope. He wasn't there? Nope. Oh, you did. Yeah, there is one person. OK. Um, <laughs> I think he would have been really happy that I'm saying Bergman. He was a regular fixture when I was a graduate student. Okay. Apparently, uh, you had to really not get cornered by him in, in the hallways because if he cornered you, he would try to tell you how important the yes. Bergman grew. You know, uh, we had this annual lecture series for many years after he died uh, from the request. The, 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 the rule was you had to have something to talk about the Bergman kernel, or at least uh. mention it during the talk. <laughs> Anyway, it's a nice idea. Um, Bergman's inequalities was his main contribution, I think. OK, so anyway, um, in terms of this information, let me write down some proposition, which is not, not difficult. It's a lot like what we've already done before. So for each h, one of these compactly supported guys of ZL, C H F. <clears throat> or maybe I say F. Yeah, it doesn't matter which which extension I use here. But um, so, and then we remember that our F 
restricted to z is little f. Um, so if I want to estimate this denominator, this is less than or equal to the integral over z of little f times uh, the integral over z of not h, but rather the Bergman projection of h. Okay, so this is almost the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. The only thing is that if you look at this formula here, because this f is holomorphic and L2 on z, uh, if you split h into its orthogonal component in the direction of the holomorphic things and the orthogonal component, then the orthogonal component is killed. So you can replace h by ph, and then you apply Cauchy-Schwarz. So, all right, good. So let's see, all together then, um, what we have now is that this CHF <coughs> squared over norm CH squared is less than or equal to um, the integral over Z of uh, PH squared uh, e to the minus phi dA over dt squared divided by um, <clears throat> the norm ch squared times this L2 norm right here. So basically, we want to prove that this thing is less than or equal to pi. We prove that, then we're good. Okay. H H is not holomorphic. H is compactly supported, smooth. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not the best. It should really be. That's really OA. C infinity is zero. Oh, well. That's really the way I should write it. <clears throat> I, I'm a little bit allergic to sheaf theory, so. Um, okay. So this is what we're going to try to prove. And now is, the, where, is where this degeneration strategy comes in. And we're going to use this Berenson theorem I spent the last couple of days discussing um, to get some information about what happens along degenerations. So OK, I'm going to be more technical. So degeneration. So this is going to be the first and it'll be um, slightly off attempt. But it's important to try it this way first and see why it fails. So, OK, so I'm going to use the notation L for the left half plane. Uh, it's only convenient to use the left half plane rather than the unit disk because of I want to I Ultimately, I'm going to want to say that some function is increasing. And if I use the unit disk, I'd have to do something funnier. So it's a convenient choice, but not a crucial one. So. And now let's let xt be our degeneration. So remember, what I said before is we're going to try to collapse x onto the initial data set. <clears throat> and if we do this correctly, then we will get some information about how 
I mean, I can sort of repeat this process for every x t, and we'll get some information about how this constant grows when we do that. Okay, so x t is going to be the set of all x in capital X such that log t of x squared is less than t. And then this t is just going to be some negative number. So uh, eventually this t will be the real part of tau. Um, so I'm looking for some, something symmetric and you'll see why. Right, so this is certainly a degeneration in, in the sense that x0 is x, and then xt is approximately z for t approximately minus infinity. Um, so now let's define some Hilbert spaces over this left half plane. So let me define h of phi sub tau to be the set of all f, which are holomorphic, on, say, x sub real part of tau sections of L, such that, and now I'm going to make a modification of the, just for normalized constants. I'm going to put e to the minus real part of tau. Uh, so, and I want x real part of tau. And then the rest is the same as before. So we want this to be finite. So these are our Hilbert spaces. And then we get kind of a vibration of the left half plane by Hilbert spaces. And of course, there, there's a vertical symmetry, but so what? Um, OK, so now for each such Hilbert space, I can pr repeat this procedure. Um, and then <clears throat> now you see that the dependence on the real part of tau, or on tau in general, it doesn't appear in the numerator because that's integrating over the submanifold Z. It only appears in the denominator. And so um, if we could apply Berenson's theorem to this family of Hilbert spaces, then we'd be in really good shape, because we would know that the logarithm of this denominator is subharmonic. Right? Um, but it only depends on the real part of tau when you look at the definition. So, a subharmonic function of tau that only depends on the real part of tau is a convex function of the real part of tau. So then, suppose you knew that this thing was also bounded. OK, well, if you have on the negative axis a bounded convex function, it can never decrease. Right? So it has to increase. That means that this constant will just get better as t goes to 0. Right? If, it, if it goes down, then by convexity, it has to go to plus infinity backwards. And so that's why I take the negative, the, the left half plane. OK. Um, right, so if you could also show that this thing, that the logarithm was bounded, or that this thing is bounded, then you, you win. Because at time t equals 0, you have the case you're interested in, and you don't know the constant, but at time t equals minus infinity, you're in that infinitesimal neighborhood where you know the constant is pi, just to take the thing you started with as the extension. So that's a little bit cheating, but it's essentially easy to see. So, um, Well, if you have a really, really skinny, so here's your z, and you have this sort of tiny neighborhood. So then to take any extension and try to estimate the L2 norm on this thing, then it's essentially going to be the value at the center times the area of the, of the transversal disk, which is pi times 
the thickness. Well, we have the square of the thickness normalizing the measure here. So the constant will be pi for t going, for t very, very large negative. So that's the rigorous version. But OK, but the problem here is, is that we can't actually apply Berenson's theorem. Because we really don't know, these are different, different spaces that we're looking at holomorphic functions of. So we can't compare different spaces for different t. And so we might not get a vector bundle. Anyway, it's, it's at least not clear. It's not a serious problem. I'm going to fix it in a second. So one way to do the integral over all of x is to just take the weight to be, uh, I guess, identically plus infinity outside xt. It's kind of potential well. And then you'll get 0 outside. And then you can think about holomorphic things on all of x. And that so by some density argument, you see it's the same. But that, that's a problem, too, because we need smooth metrics. So what I'm going to do, essentially, is smooth that in a good way for which I can apply. So I need to smooth it in a way that's still plurisubharmonic, because the hypothesis in Berenson's theorem is that the metrics are plurisubharmonic. I mean, after you add the Ricci curvature. So, OK. So no, I didn't say it yet because I haven't written the. But you're right. Basically, once I write this thing down, if you've been paying attention, it's done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, uh -huh. Could you write down like what you said the last five minutes, I think? <laughs> I will. I will. Okay, I wanted to say it before I write it. So that's my strategy for telling you things twice. OK. So but OK, if you want just a quick repetition. The, you're asking about the deformation part? No, no, no. I, I just wanted to see something. But it's like okay. I'll write it. OK. All right. So OK, so let's let. Uh, so the function that we want to add to our initial weight phi on x is the function psi t. It's going to be a map from x cross l. I'm writing sub, sub tau, but the tau is living in the left half plane. So it maps. Uh, maybe I should write it like this. So, so it maps x tau to, well, so you want to sort of get a good plurisubharmonic approximation of this phi restricted to x sub real part of tau. So what you do is you take, uh, just want to have a little more space. So you take log of mod t of x squared minus the real part of tau. And that's good as long as it's uh, well, that's good as long as it's positive, but it can become negative when you get close to z. And so what you do is you take the max of this and 0. Okay. And so anyway, for, for t of x less than real part of tau, or squared less than real part of tau, this thing is 0. And so you get this part. Uh, but then when it, when it gets bigger than, when you get outside this region, you get this contribution, but it's not necessarily large. So, so what we do is define an, our metric E phi tau to be E uh, to the minus phi plus, and then we multiply by some number P times C tau, and P is going to be just very, very large, okay? but fixed. And so in the proof, what we're ultimately going to do is just take it sufficiently large to prove certain estimates, which I'm not going to do here. But it's really just basic calculus um, to estimate those things. But this is the right kind of approximation uh, in order to get the kind of space that we're, we're looking for for application of Berenson's theorem. So let me just say it again. So the limit as p goes to infinity of the integral over x of okay. 
let me just try it. It might be off by some adding some real part of tau here. But I have blackboard amnesia, so I can't really. So this depends on p, but I'm not putting the, the p dependence in the notation. But as you go to infinity, you get this integral. So I think I must, I must have to add something like plus real part of tau. OK, so you'll, you can take my word for it or, or read in the notes how you handle these technicalities. But this is not, once we're going to work from here. We're not actually going to take this limit. I just added this in order to get this factor. Oh, just, okay, that's all. Yeah. That's, anyway, that's not the. It's not so important. So I may have a typo. But I can't tell here. Um, right. So now you know all the data here extends up to the boundary. So actually, this is the same Hilbert space as if you leave out this psi sub t. So now you do have an actual trivial vector bundle with a non-trivial metric given by this. So now you really can apply Berenson's theorem. And so we have to do what we said we have to do. So So I didn't, I didn't name these things, but these are going to live in the space h phi sub. Well, let's just use t now, since there is this. Just assume t is real for this. So we want to show that this is less than or equal to pi. And I'm not going to, as I said, do, do all the details. Um, So I mean you have to you have to do some estimates that involve some basic complex analysis and there it's not really worth doing here it's better to just do it the way I had said before just think about if you know that you can go down to zero then you do get the sharp constant um, and so all you have to know I guess I'm done all you have to know is that this thing is a convex increasing function so you need to show that it's that this norm is bounded. And then Berenson's theorem implies that it's uh, convex. Strictly speaking, the logarithm is convex, but then the exponential of the logarithm will be convex. Right, and the boundedness is essentially the same computation as, as this kind of thing. So Right. 
What is uh, CH acting on some section F? <clears throat> It's not exactly that, but it's the X analog of... Well, no, it is. Right. So this is the integral of, say, F H bar e to the minus phi over dt squared omega over z. Yeah, so there is a little bit that you have to do here. Sorry, I'm uh, saying this a little sloppy, but... Let me, let me just explain how, how you get that this is bounded by the L2 norm of F. So there is a step here. You, you have to use this, this Bergman's inequality to say that the, the value of F at a point of Z is controlled by the L2 norm on some neighborhood of Z. Right? And so once you know that, everything else is a smooth, compactly supported thing. And so that's, that's really it. There's some constant that depends on H times the norm of F in this T. So that's, I think that's, yeah. Okay, so that's the end of the proof as far as I'm going to give it. Like I said, there's some details to fill in, but they're not the, they're not the kind of interesting details of the Berenson theorem part of the story. More some basic complex analysis. But, um, so let me give you a slight preview of what, what I want to do next lecture. Um, and maybe end a couple minutes short. Nobody will hate me for that. Okay, so what what have we what have we done today? Well, we've proved this theorem. Yeah. Before you read that picture, the pi part. Yeah. You said it kind of you have to estimate. Right. So this thing looks like a cylinder around Z. And the radius is um, t, which is a real part of tau. Right. And so the integral of any extension, if that thing is really skinny, extension is more or less constant in the perpendicular direction. So the integral is more or less uh, the integral of little f over the disk and then integrate it over z. But if little f is constant there, it's the central value times the area. So the area is pi times t squared, but I have, or maybe it's not t, it's log t. So the way I've defined it is log t. So this is, this is 1 over the t squared, as I'm defining it. And maybe that was not the right thing. Sorry. It's defined by log t. So mod t squared is less than e to the t. So I, that's not right. Sorry. So this is e to the t. Very, very small number because t is negative. And you have the, the area as e to the t. So the radius is e to the t over 2. Sorry. So that's, is that the confusion? Well, Maybe. No, I want Many to things. Say it again. Yeah. Many confusions. <laughs> OK. Right. So just a couple words. Um, so we use this, this Berenson theorem to prove this theorem here. Um, by sort of degenerating something. And then we've got this family of Hilbert spaces. And if we had tried to use this approach,